Good morning and welcome to the Institute for Food Safety at Cornell University, or what we like to call it is IFS at CU. This is our webinar on food safety from farm to fork. I am Dr. Elizabeth Demings. I'm the program coordinator for the IFS at CU and I will be moderating today's event. I'm really excited to be able to host this webinar today in celebration of World Food Safety Day. So today's webinar features four of our food safety experts. But before we begin, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about World Food Safety Day. So it's estimated that about 600 million or almost 1 in 10 people in the world will become ill after eating contaminated food. And 420,000 people die every year. So to bring awareness to these staggering number of cases of foodborne illnesses and the deaths worldwide, and to reduce the occurrence of foodborne illnesses, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution on December 20th, 2018, designating World Food Safety Day as June 7th. So now, and every June 7th thereafter, will be a time to celebrate the countless benefits of safe food. So in both by Codex Secretary Tom Highland, World Food Safety Day will be a chance for everyone to take a moment to think about something we take for granted, which is food safety. So this year's thing, food safety is everyone's business, and that highlights that whether you produce, process, sell, or prepare food, you have a role in keeping that safe. This plays really well into what the IFS of CU's primary focus is, food safety. So we thought it was the perfect fit to present this webinar today on World Food Safety Day to highlight some of the work that we're doing. And so our collaborating programs uh, really have an impact that stretches from um, local to global communities. And they have a breadth of coverage that spans from producers on the farm all the way through the consumer's tables. So today you'll hear from our four experts who are going to provide insight on some of the work being done in fresh produce, dairy foods, and food processing and manufacturing. If you would like to learn more about the IFS and our collaborating programs, you can visit our website on the Institute for Food Safety And we have fact sheets that are posted that you can download on trainings and the services and programs that we offer. We also keep a running news feed and a list of upcoming events on our main homepage. And you can also join our mailing list here. So if you want to receive future newsletters, announcements, food safety information and news, this is really the best way to ensure that you stay up to date with what we're doing. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Dr. Elizabeth Finn is the Director of the Produce Safety Alliance and National GAPS Program. Executive Director of the Institute for Food Safety at Cornell University here in the Department of Food Science at Cornell. She received her BS in Zoology from The Ohio State University, her MS in Horticulture from the University of Florida, and her PhD in Food Science from Cornell University. Her research focuses on surface water quality used in the production of fruits and vegetables. Her extension program is focused on providing fundamental science-based food safety knowledge to farmers, packers, food industry, regulatory personnel, and others interested in food safety. And so with that, Betsy, I know that you will take it. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be on the webinar this morning and celebrate World Food Safety Day. My topic is going to be produce safety, and we're going to start off this morning asking you all to participate. What I would like to know is when you hear produce safety, what do you think about? What does it mean to you? And hopefully we can get a poll up here. Okay, we'll see if we can see the answers. All right, concerns about microbial issues is leading the way, but it is followed by concerns about availability and access is number two. Concerns about pesticides is number three at 7%. Concerns about price is 5%. And concerns about uh, intentional adulteration is 2%. Thank you guys very much for filling that out. I think the key reason I wanted to start this question is, is that produce safety means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I think all of these things are topics that people have expressed to me as concerns and are things that we are working on that are all related to the safety of produce. So when I think about produce safety challenges, there are many of them. Lots of produce is eaten raw. So from a microbial standpoint, if any contamination happens in its environment where it's grown outside with soils, animals, surface water, hand harvested by people who, uh, you know, do not always have the best hand washing etiquette. If you look across the globe, we all sometimes don't wash our hands properly. 
and then weather, all of these things represent risk to produce. And then when it's eaten raw, anything that gets on the produce during production or packing can persist and, and make people sick. Microbial contamination on produce is extremely difficult to remove once it's present due to the topical nature and characteristics of produce. Peaches are fuzzy, kale is crinkly, all of those little crevices allow contamination to get in there and make it difficult to remove. There are many different commodities, which is wonderful from a selection of having access to a wonderful variety of fruits and vegetables, but it also adds to the complexity and to the challenges. And then finally, when we talk about growing fruits and vegetables, there are many different production practices. Just looking at the U.S., and I don't want to be U.S.-centric, but if you just look at the United States, we have many different temperature regions. We have many different sources of water, types of soils, environments, and all of that adds to the challenges related to keeping produce safe. In thinking about produce safety, it's also important to consider what the grower challenges are. And I think first and foremost, produce safety is not the only priority they have. Any of you living in the Northeast know that this spring has been wet, wet with a side of wet. Many plantings are very late getting in, and that's something growers all over have to deal with. What is the weather doing? On top of that, they have variable markets. So whether the market is demanding a certain product or not interested anymore, one of the big interesting ones going on right now is apples. A lot of people want the new and upcoming varieties, maybe not understanding that it takes a while to get an orchard established, it takes a while to get those varieties available, and what do you do with the trees that are growing the older varieties, right? So those are things growers have to deal with. Certainly pests, pests are always changing, certainly climate change impacts where pests go, what the pressure is. Spotted wing drosophila, for instance, in berries is certainly changing the way things are managed. Labor is an ever-present concern for growers, having enough labor to harvest and to plant and to work the fields. We all know that nationwide this is an issue. On top of that, there's lots of these variables, and I already mentioned weather and markets, but those variations and variabilities within those things, including prices and consumer and buyer demands, are absolutely a challenge that growers have to work with. Those buyer demands can be different than regulatory demands. Anybody who works in food safety is probably familiar with the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FSMA, and that's sort of new for growers. Not sort of new, it is new. I shouldn't use that word. 2011 was when we saw FISMA signed into law. We didn't see the produce safety rules show up until the end of 2015. Some of those demands are different than buyer demands. So growers have to manage these food safety demands and the differences. And then on top of it for farmers, the expectations for their food safety expertise is different from the rest of the food industry. And what I mean here is that in a food production facility, They'll have a food safety team that does their risk assessment. They'll have a food safety team that picks out practices. On a lot of farms, it's just the farmer deciding what the risks are and deciding how to implement practices. And these growers may or may not have had food safety training or food safety classwork. So it's a little bit different and puts a lot of pressure on the growers. So in terms of the evolution of food safety, I did just want to put up a few points. Really, when we started talking about produce safety, it really evolved from the 1998 FDA Guide to Minimize Microbial Food Safety Hazards in Fresh Fruits and Vegetables that really indicated we were seeing an uptick in foodborne illnesses associated with fresh produce. Shortly thereafter, we saw growers getting letters from buyers asking them if they've implemented food safety practices. And about that time was when the Cornell Good Agricultural Practices Program got established so we've been working in this area since 1999, about the time all of the produce safety focus got rolling. In 2006, we had the spinach outbreak, which certainly was a game changer for the leafy greens industry, resulting in the leafy greens marketing agreement. And things kept going along until we had more outbreaks in tomatoes. And so we saw the first statewide program in 2008 for the state of Florida linked to tomatoes. And then after that, 2010, we see the Produce Safety Alliance established knowing that in 2011, we were going to see FSMA signed into law. Unfortunately, we also saw a listeria outbreak in cantaloupe that year as well. 
And then in 2015, we saw the produce safety rule. So I just want to give you a perspective that produce safety is not new. It's certainly something we've been working on for the better part of 20 years. So I'm going to turn my attention to some of the work that the Produce Safety Alliance is doing because of the little time commitment we have here. It's based at Cornell, but the PSA team is located throughout the country, and they facilitate collaboration and outreach to growers and produce industry every day across the country. Our focus is on helping growers understand the FSMA produce safety rule and meet those requirements, but within the farm context. And what I mean by that is looking at the time, the money, the personnel that the farm have, those buyer requirements that I talked about earlier that might be different, and being responsive to growers' requests for more information and technical assistance. This next slide gives you an idea of what the team looks like and how in the country the FDA has broken out the country into these regions. The colors on the map represent the federal regions that have been broken out. There are regional centers focused on produce safety in each of these groups. But this picture will hopefully give you an idea of the PSA team, where they're located, and how we attempt to address things in a national effort. So when we talk about produce safety, I think it's important to consider all of the areas that impact produce safety throughout the food system, whether it's the water that's applied, the soil amendments that are applied for nutrition and growth support, domesticated and wild animals that are a natural part of the farm landscape, certainly worker health hygiene and training because most fresh produce is harvested by hand. And so the importance of worker health and hygiene cannot be overstated. But there's also the issues of equipment that we use, tools, buildings, sanitation. How do we keep things clean to prevent cross-contamination? And this is a big menu of items and hopefully is highlighting what is involved and what it will take to keep produce safe. So what we hope we're doing and what we hope the value to stakeholders is, is improving the understanding and implementation of food safety practices. And what this means is things like helping them understand what it takes in the field for workers to stay healthy, providing water. What does it look like in a packing house when you're talking about pest control, pest monitoring? And then, of course, trying to keep track of all the records that are needed to keep your food safety program on task, focused, and efficiently moving forward. We also want to ensure a safe and abundant supply of fruits and vegetables. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later again when we talk about consumers, but it's important to all of us that we have access to safe and abundant supply of fruits and vegetables. On the survey I did earlier, 10% of the respondents, I believe, were talking about access to produce. And that is a key thing that is paramount on everyone's mind. Produce Safety Alliance also develops unique multilingual educational materials to help guide risk assessment on farms and packing houses. I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about challenges for growers, but the thing is, is growers are really tasked with a heavy lift. They've got to understand risks, they've got to figure out practices, and the Produce Safety Alliance spends a lot of time trying to create education materials to help them walk through this in a logical way that is mindful of the limited time, limited resources they have. And we think it is critically important that growers remain economically viable in the marketplace. If you want to talk about access to fruits and vegetables, you've got to have farmers growing fruits and vegetables. And anytime there are more regulations, more requirements, more audits, that adds to the pressure on farmers. And I think that's an important thing to stay focused on is that we all need access. And in order to have access, we need to have economically viable farms. I wanted to share with you a little bit of how we do this. How do we reach growers in the country? This is a couple of maps. The green one on the left is a map of the train the trainer courses that have been held in the U.S. by the Produce Safety Alliance. And the key thing here is I showed you our little team. Our little team can't train all the growers in the country. So we have a system set up to train trainers across the country. The graph on the right in blue and black is the number of grower training courses we've held since we launched in 2016. The darker the state, the more trainings that have been held. Beth just advanced and you can see that number right there. We've trained over 36,000 growers. 25,000 domestically, 11,000 internationally. And if you hit the button again, Beth, you'll see how many trainers we have. So we have 2,500 trainers trained. 
And that really allows us to work functionally, not only domestically, but you can see there the international impact. And the international program is really just getting going. This is sort of to wrap up. I really do want to talk about the importance of fresh produce to consumers. Fruits and vegetables are delicious. They provide valuable nutrients. Consumption can reduce the risk of certain cancers help people maintain a healthy body weight, which is important because obesity is certainly a health issue. It can also reduce heart disease risks. And local production is important to addressing food deserts. And that is just key to having everyone have access to fruits and vegetables. I wanted to show you where you could find some of these PSA resources and materials. We're also linked up through the IFS at CU website as well. We have our own listserv, but we absolutely welcome you to visit, join the listserv if produce safety is something you're interested in or a field you want to expand into. There's my contact information as well. And with that, I will be happy to take some questions. The question came in says, with healthy access, does your team do any work with training farms on cleaning programs or ways to create value-added products from produce that is not up to market standard? So there are a lot of programs that have popped up recently focused on, I guess, what they're calling ugly fruit and trying to get people to get used to having produce that is not pretty or perfect. Certainly within the retail marketplace, you see that, but there's a lot of effort on that. In terms of what we do, we work with all farmers. We certainly talk about gleaning programs. Importantly, a lot of gleaning programs will go to places like soup kitchens and other places where some of the clientele are immunocompromised for a lot of reasons, either they're sick or biologically, whether they're old people or very young people. So that's the most important part to us is that when gleaning is happening, that safety is also a topic of discussion, making sure gleaning bins are clean, making sure people that are gleaning are trained. So we absolutely do talk about this, and I'm happy to see that we are talking about food waste more globally and looking at how to get the most out of every harvest. Yeah, I see a question there about evaluate the outcomes of the training. Every training has an evaluation that goes with it, and we are in the process right now of creating reports to share that data with people. We find evaluations to be very, very important. We review them. We make changes to the curriculum as things are pointed out. So I appreciate that question about evaluations. I see a question from Anne. After the farmers are GAPS trained, how do you know if the information is absorbed? That's a great question, Anne. So one of the things we do is follow up with farmers. In the case of some of our trainings, we'll do a PSA training on day one. We'll do a farm writing plan on day two. As we talk with growers, as the growers interact with us and ask us for additional information, how do we put practices into place? We also do refreshers. We have additional modules that we're creating. We're also creating an advanced train the trainer course to keep more information coming in those areas that growers have a lot of questions about, such as water testing, sanitary design of equipment and facilities. So we absolutely are working on all that stuff. And as I see Billy Mitchell's name as a question there, it's important also to reach out and collaborate with a lot of different groups, which I think the PSA has really focused on in terms of states, in terms of other groups like the Local Food Safety Collaborative, and work with people to expand trainings to all growers, whether or not they're covered by the rule. Billy asks, are there any suggestions for online courses or books to get started on learning about microbiology 101 and produce safety? It's a great question, Billy. We actually have something internal. I hadn't thought about putting it out, but you should know that the IFS is working on an online intro to microbiology class, and we are hoping to have that launched in the fall. It will be an online course, and that would be a great way to meet the needs of the industry. I'm going to move to Christine's. Is there a difference in training domestically and internationally? No. When it comes to the PSA training, one of the things we really try to do is get a consistent product. So we have the same requirements. Trainings must be trainers that are through the PSA process. There must be a lead trainer there. We are working on translations, which I think is very important. 
important to talk about for the international, making sure people have books in the language that they read. So no, from a PSA standpoint, international delivery and domestic delivery should be aligned. Do you guys work on materials translation in French and other languages? We have one in Spanish right now. We're working on one in Chinese, one in Haitian Creole, and several other languages are on the list. I think that's all, Beth, and I think I've used my time. Thank you, Betsy, for your talk. Yep, thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Nicole Martin. She is the Associate Director of the Milk Quality Improvement Program, also known as the MQIP in the Department of Food Science here at Cornell. Nicole received her BS, her MS, and her PhD degrees all from food science at Cornell. In her role, she oversees the Farm to Consumer Dairy Microbiology Research conducted in the MQIP, and she works closely with dairy industry stakeholders, including producers and processors. Nicole studies the transmission of spoilage organisms from environmental niches into raw and processed dairy products, the strategies to reduce or eliminate this transmission, and the implications of spoilage organisms on finished products and methods of protection. So with that, Nicole, I'll let you take the stage. Thanks, Beth. So I wanted to start with just an overview of our program, and we have a theme, I think, today in what I'm going to talk about, and that's also reflected in our vision and our mission, and that is working through a comprehensive framework from the farm through the consumer to improve quality and safety of dairy products. And so our vision is moving the world towards safer, more wholesome food, and our mission is through innovative research, education, and outreach, improve the microbial safety and quality of the global food supply. So we have a few areas that we focus on in the milk quality improvement program at the farm level. We look at farm practices and raw milk quality, specifically how they relate to the quality and safety of finished dairy products. In processing facilities, again, looking at organisms that can transmit into finished dairy products and either affect the quality or safety, working directly with processors to improve those processes. And then at the consumer level, we do a lot of sensory research on how do these different impacts at both the farm and the processing level affect a consumer's willingness to buy, acceptability of those products. And then a huge part of our program is at extension services and workforce development, where we work directly with producers, processors, retailers to advance the dairy industry with training, with assistance, mentoring, and troubleshooting and root cause analysis when a problem occurs. So when we think about this framework of farm to consumer quality and safety of dairy products, there are a few parameters at the farm level and the processing level that really influence the quality and safety of dairy products. And at the farm level, those include cow and equipment hygiene, adequate cooling of raw milk, absorbed off flavors and odors, and the influence of spore-forming bacteria. And then at the processing level, employee and equipment hygiene processing parameters. So for example, what temperature is the product processed at or pasteurized at? The influence of post-pasteurization contamination with either bacterial organisms or fungal organisms depending on the product, and then environmental pathogen contamination. And so today I'm going to talk just a little bit about three of those things. So spore-forming bacteria at the farm level, and then post-pasteurization contamination with spoilage organisms and environmental pathogen contamination. So fluid milk is a really good example of how the farm and processing parameters and factors can influence the outcome of quality in the product. And so that's demonstrated here with this simple graph. And what we have on the bottom on the x-axis is just time, so days after pasteurization. On the y-axis is the total number of bacteria, and you can see two different growth curves. The one that has triangular-shaped icons is for gram-positive spore-forming bacteria. These are organisms that enter the raw milk supply on the farm, are influenced by practices that happen at the farm. They survive pasteurization because they're in a resistant structure when they are in the raw milk, and then after pasteurization, they can subsequently grow. And so you can see that for the first 10 days after pasteurization, we see hardly any growth at all. But then after 10 days, they start to grow pretty rapidly and reach spoilage levels, typically somewhere around 17 days after pasteurization. 
And this is really critical for the dairy industry because these organisms are what limit processors' ability to extend shelf life because they're inherent in the raw milk. And then conversely, we have the growth curve with the square icons, and that represents Pseudomonas. And Pseudomonas is an organism that is both abundant in raw milk, but can also be abundant in the processing facility. And when it's in raw milk and is pasteurized, those organisms are killed. But when they are reintroduced after pasteurization, they can grow very rapidly in the product. And we call this post-pasteurization contamination because after our heat step, we're getting recontamination with the product. And so you can see that those grow much more rapidly. They typically soil the product between 7 and 10 days after pasteurization. And so, of course, from the processor's perspective, again, this is pretty dramatic as far as what they're offering. Their consumers might spoil in the marketplace, and so controlling this is really critical. We see that in the marketplace, about 50% of fluid milk is spoiled because of pseudomonas and other post-processing contaminants that come from the processing environment, and 50% is spoiled because of gram-positive spore formers that are coming from the dairy farm environment. So we can really see this borne out here where both environments are really affecting the quality of this product. And so it's the same idea with pathogens. We have both farm level environmental sources of pathogens as well as processing sources of pathogens. So when we think about pathogen sources at the farm, of course, one big one is animal feces, right? Because we have a lot of bacterial pathogens that are associated with the intestinal tract of warm-blooded animals. So Campylobacter, E. coli and salmonella are abundant on the dairy farm environment. But we also have in dairy farm environments Listeria monocytogenes, which is not associated with the intestinal tract of warm blooded animals, but it is widely distributed in natural environments such as dairy farms. And then again, we can switch to the processing level. And here again, we have a number of microorganisms that are found frequently in processing environments. And so again, we have Listeria monocytogenes and Salmonella and then Chronobacter, which is sort of particular to dry dairy products, but these pathogens all live happily in the processing environment and can persist for a very long period of time. So for example, with Listeria monocytogenes, we have documented cases of the same drain of Listeria causing foodborne disease decades apart from the same facility. So this organism is very good at finding a place in the facility to survive and grow and contaminate products. So I'm going to focus a little bit on Listeria monocytogenes because when we talk about foodborne disease, this is one of the big ones that we think about. So this is an environmental pathogen. As I mentioned, it's widely distributed in various environments, and I have some statistics in a few slides that I'll show you about that. And when it causes disease, it's usually foodborne. It's very hardy, so unlike a lot of other pathogens that can grow at refrigeration temperatures, so refrigeration is not an adequate hurdle by itself to prevent the growth of Listeria monocytogenes, and it can survive very stressful conditions, for example, high salt conditions. So this is sort of the, you know, all-star pathogen with these abilities to overcome hurdles that would otherwise prevent other pathogens from growing. Listeria monocytogenes is commonly associated with ready-to-eat foods. And that's because of its ability to survive in processing environments. So its ability to go from a processing environment into the finished product where there's no further heat step to kill that organism. And like I mentioned, it's capable of persisting for years in processing environments. And this has been demonstrated in a number of different industries, in the dairy industry, in the meat industry. It's very good at persisting for a very long period of time if it's not eliminated in that facility. So the illnesses caused by Listeria monocytogenes range from just mild gastroenteritis for healthy adults who don't have any underlying health issues to listeriosis, which is the severe form of the disease. And when a person contracts listeriosis, there's a very high case fatality rate. So a lot of people who contract this serious disease of listeriosis actually die from it. And the susceptible populations include pregnant women and their fetuses, immunocompromised individuals, and the elderly. And like I said, listeria is widely distributed in environments, and so this has been studied in a number of different environments, from natural environments, where we have a 1% to 8% prevalence, and that's in New York State urban environments, so that's in stores, on sidewalks, where you might be walking every day, about a 7.3% prevalence, and that's also in New York. 
And then you can see on ruminant farms, you can have very high levels of listeria monocytogenes. And it kind of depends um, a little bit on whether there has been a listeriosis case or not, because listeria monocytogenes can actually affect a huge range of mammals, including cows and llamas, and I think it's over 40 different species. And then down here at the bottom, we have food processing environments. And so what we've seen from a number of different studies is that the prevalence of Listeria monocytogenes in processing environments can range from you know, less than detected 0.1% to 30% or more. And so this is really the key when we're talking about food safety and focusing on food safety is that this organism can be found very frequently in food processing environments and specifically in food processing environments that do not have a program to control those organisms. So we're going to focus on that. And of course, we have a number of examples, unfortunately, of Listeria monocytogenes that have originated in processing environments and then contaminated food products and caused disease. And so this is an example of the Crave Brothers outbreak in 2013. There were six cases, one death, one miscarriage. And what the CDC found was that it was likely caused by contamination during the cheese making process. So this organism transmitted from the environment into the product, and then that organism was able to grow in that product and cause disease. And so what we do in the food industry and what's really important is what we call environmental monitoring or pathogen environmental monitoring. And what we recommend in our consulting with the industry and working with the industry is what we call a seek and destroy approach to preventing contamination with Listeria monocytogenes and other pathogens. And so the goal of monitoring the processing environment for pathogens like Listeria monocytogenes is to find them if they're there. And in most cases, there are places in processing facilities that we call niches where Listeria monocytogenes or other pathogens can live and survive and not be eliminated through the normal course of cleaning and sanitation. And so through environmental monitoring, what we're doing is trying to find those sources, trying to find where Listeria or Salmonella might live in that processing environment, and then follow up with that source and try to eliminate that pathogen. And so in the dairy industry, what we really try to promote is the need to set up a system that encourages collection of samples that will yield positive results. So we want to encourage the employees who are doing this monitoring to find a positive if it's there, find that listeria if it's there, so that it can be mitigated. And like I say here, the goal is either to eradicate or mitigate the effect of those niches. And this approach, the seek and destroy strategy, can be applied to the entire facility and should be applied to the entire facility, but can also be applied to specific pieces of equipment or new areas of the facility if those situations arrive. And then kind of a secondary goal of environmental monitoring is to confirm the effectiveness of problem-solving procedures that are in place in the facility. So if we have a positive for listeria and we retest that location after we clean and sanitize and we see that we still have a positive, then our strategy to eliminate that organism wasn't effective and then we need to rethink how we approach that. And so how a lot of facilities approach environmental monitoring is through what we call the zone concept and there are a few different ways of doing that, but a four zone concept is pretty common. And that is simply just using a risk-based approach to break the facility up into different zones or how close the location is to the product coming into contact with the surface in the facility and basing the number of samples we take and how we follow up on those samples on this concept. So I have a diagram here that shows that zone one is product contact surfaces. So this is where the product is coming directly into contact with a surface in the facility. So this could be a slicer or peeler, knives, racks, a work table. In fluid milk, it would be the filler. Zone two would be areas immediately adjacent to zone one. So if we have a positive in a zone two, then the risk is pretty high that that organism could get onto a product contact surface. And then we sort of go out from there. So a zone three would be further away from the product contact surface and zone four would be sort of outside areas. So maybe like locker rooms or hallways, those kind of things. So here in this photo of our Cornell dairy plant, 
you can sort of find the zones by looking at where the product is coming in contact with the environment. So we have on the left side the filler. So the product is directly coming into contact with that filler. And then under that, we have a conveyor belt, which might be a zone two. Under that filler, we have a drain that could be a zone three. And then outside of that area, maybe in the hallway, we have a zone four. So you can sort of break up your facility into areas of risk and then design your product, your environmental monitoring program to address those specific risks. And so the most key component of this program is how then do you address if you have a positive? And so this is all part of a corrective action plan that usually involves some sort of root cause analysis of why that location had a positive. Most often there's going to be some sort of cleaning and sanitation that happens in that location to try to eliminate the organism from that location. And typically there will be additional swabbing that happens, so vector swabbing, where you would go back to that original site and you would swab to the sides of it, above it, and below it if possible. And then what some facilities choose to do is to map those positives, and this is an example here on this slide of the contamination onto the, a facility map, and that allows the processor to observe how is that organism potentially moving through the facility and what kinds of patterns do we see in those positives that could give us some insight into how to eliminate that organism. And so sort of wrapping up those ideas, I call your attention back to the fact that food processing environments in and of themselves are a very important source of pathogens, and in particular Listeria monocytogenes, but also Salmonella and Chronobacter. These organisms can persist for very long periods of time and have all been linked to costly recalls and outbreaks. These pathogen environmental monitoring programs are very critical to a safe food supply. And so all processing facilities would need to be doing some sort of pathogen environmental monitoring program. And what type of program is going to be dependent on the size of the facility, the risk of the product, how often they're processing, a number of different factors. And so these are really, you know, have to be very individual programs for each individual facility. And then the results of these programs need to be used immediately for corrective actions, as well as long-term improvements if needed, in order to really address the risk of that pathogen entering the ready-to-eat product. And so finally, I just want to come back to this idea of a comprehensive approach to dairy food safety from the farm and what's happening there as far as practices and raw milk quality all the way through the consumer and how the consumer perceives the product from a quality perspective, as well as from their confidence in the industry to produce a safe product. And then how we are working here at Cornell with the dairy industry from the farm through processing and retailers to address issues that will allow producers and processors to create high quality and safe foods. So this is our team in the Milk Quality Improvement Program, a few of them, not all of them, enjoying some delicious milk. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. We'll go ahead and take, we got uh, two questions in. And the first one was, will we have access to this info? And the answer to that question is yes, we do plan on posting a recording of this webinar as well as sending this out to um, uh, our And then the other question came in is, are the standards for facilities out of the U.S. the same as U.S. facilities? So the standards for environmental monitoring, is that? The standards for food processing. So no, generally. I mean, that's a pretty broad term, but certainly different countries are going to have different standards for, you know, the levels of different microorganisms that are allowed in dairy products, how those dairy products are, and for that matter, what the quality of raw milk has to be before it's processed how the processing has to happen. So those are definitely going to vary from country to country. I think we're going to move on for the sake of time um, to our next speaker. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Sam Alpain. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Food Science and has a research program that's focused on the quality, safety, and application of fermented dairy products and co products. He is also the lead investigator on a USDA NEPA food safety and outreach program funded project, which is hosting dairy food safety plan and coaching workshops across the US. And that is what he'll be talking about today. So Sam, I'll let you take the floor. 
Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, I'm Sam Alcan. I've been here at Cornell just coming on three years. And before joining, I worked in the dairy industry and I was responsible for food safety for a large uh, international ice cream company. You know, I've got a long love affair of dairy. It's part of my day. I don't know other people here on the webinar, but you know, I had yogurt for breakfast today. I'm going to have cheese for lunch. And if I feel like I behave well, I'm going to have ice cream for dinner. And so Dairy is, you know, a great component of my life. Um, but one of the challenges that we have, unfortunately, if we go to the next slide, is from a food safety perspective, about nearly one in five of bacterial foodborne illnesses here in the U.S. are attributed to dairy products. And over the years, we've had a number of recalls, and here's just a, a smattering of a few out there from across the country, including here in New York State, that are attributed either to failures in sanitation and hygiene programs that then allow for contamination of these dairy products or a breakdown in a critical process that's meant to eliminate potential pathogens from the product. As was mentioned earlier, right, we had the, the Food Safety Modernization Act that was initially passed in 2011, and that started to develop the new regulations for food processors. And as part of that, FDA developed the regulations for the preventative controls for human foods, which really raised the bar and outlined the new standards for food safety that processors were going to have to meet. And now, as of last fall, pretty much all the companies here in the United States, whether they're large or small companies, are supposed to be in compliance with these regulations. And a key component of these regulations is around education, right? As part of the food safety plan, the person responsible for that is supposed to be a preventative controls qualified individual. And to establish yourself as a preventative controls qualified individual, there's one or two ways. You could have a ton of experience in food safety, which I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that do, that provides you the experience and expertise to develop food safety plans, or you go through an approved or a course, right, that lays out the fundamentals of the food safety plan. And the main course that's out there was developed by the Food Safety Preventative Controls Alliance that a lot of people have taken that goes through the regulations and outlines the requirements for preventative controls for human foods, which basically builds on what was traditionally our HACCP, right, which contained a hazard analysis and then identify critical control points, and then takes elements that traditionally we had thought of as prerequisite programs, GMPs, and things like that, and elevates them to a higher level in our food safety plan that requires more documentation and attention by the producer. So things around allergen control, our sanitation controls to prevent contamination from the environment, requires a recall plan, and then also, depending on the types of ingredients that you're bringing in, a supply chain program to control any hazards that are associated with them. Now this course is a two and a half day intensive course. I saw Anne was on the, the participants list. I got to teach it a few weeks ago with her in Brooklyn. And it's also a very expensive course to take. And so if we go to our next slide, a lot of our smaller producers, when they walk out of that course and look at what they have to do based on the regulations, they feel like this is a huge upward climb. Betsy mentioned earlier that some of the differences for farmers and produce growers compared to large manufacturers, right, is that there's only a few of them responsible for their actual food safety on their site. And there's a lot of similarities to that for our artists and food producers, where a lot of these are one to two person companies, and they're wearing every single hat. So really sitting down and understanding what the requirements are, how to adequately do your risk analysis, and develop the documentation to show that you're implementing your food safety plan sufficiently is a very big challenge for them. And they come out of that course with their head spinning. And for some of them, the price of the FSPCA course is too high for them to actually be able to take it. So a lot of them are kind of falling through the cracks. So our kind of thought was, based on our experience with the FSPCA training, was how could we kind of develop systems to further support our artists and producers so that they can actually make that climb? And so that kind of began through kind of this core group here that started really the Nexus was the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy. I don't know if people on the call are familiar with them. They're kind of an arm of the National Dairy Council, which is a nonprofit organization that is supported through the checkoff dollars of our U.S. dairy farmers. And it does a bit of investment into research and education for dairy food safety. And the Innovation Center has a standing group that is focused around artisan cheese food safety that pulled people, stakeholders from industry, uh, from retailers, from academia, and from government to kind of talk about what were the issues and gaps 
As part of that group, Dennis D'Amico over at the University of Connecticut had done a series of uh, small conferences with artists and cheesemakers to kind of identify the gaps in their food safety programs. And then Clint Stevenson had done some work developing online programs to kind of do education around basic GMPs and food safety practices for artists and cheesemakers. And then we all came together to write a grant to kind of pull together all this and kind of take it from online into actually a coaching program to help these artists and cheesemakers actually understand the regulations and develop that documentation. And we applied then for an FSOP grant from USDA. And that's what allowed us to pull together this program and then provide uh, coaching workshops at a reasonable cost for these small artists and producers. We, we run it for $49 and it allows us to run it in unison with other groups around the nation. The idea really was very focused still on the preventative controls for human foods material from FSPCA. So using that as a framework, but really then focusing on the core parts of each of the sections there from foundations, the hazard analysis, and then after key sections breaking out into coaching sessions where we'd have food safety experts, myself, my co-PIs, and then we work very closely with other extension organizations at universities around the country to then actually sit down with artists and cheesemakers and go through this focused on their actual production facility to understand the hazards and challenges that are really particular to their facility and that they're facing. And it's a two-day course. And so we really provide them with templates, right? And sit down. Some of these participants are really new to the process, so helping them uh, develop a flow diagram, right? You know, if you're in the food safety and food production world, the concept of unit operations is probably, you know, you take it for granted, but for a lot of these small producers, they don't think that way. And so getting them to actually sit down, outline their process so that we can then help them walk through a hazard analysis of their ingredients and their processing steps and their distribution is key. And then we also have templates to help them identify all the controls that are required through the preventive controls for human foods regulation. So things like their process controls, their sanitation controls, allergen controls, and supply chain controls. And then we also have a template that helps them walk through and then establish what they need to have in place to have an adequate food recall plan. And so we'll take these two days to go through the process. And if we go to the next slide... Another key thing is that unlike the FSPCA material, which is at a very high level and uses some food commodities as examples, we actually use dairy focus examples. We have some uh, collaboration with the University of Wisconsin. They had developed pepper jack cheese uh, example for the preventative controls for human food workshop. And so we've used that as part of the basis. It's sometimes at a little higher level than what a lot of our small artisans have in their facility, but it gives them a very good foundation to start looking at what are the types of questions and things they should be looking for in their own facilities. Another great part about these coaching workshops is that our participants are from all over the process. So we have some participants that are looking to get into dairy production. So we've seen a lot of farmers that are right now with milk pricing are looking to add other sources of revenue to their business and are looking then to start a small, say, creamery alongside their farm. And so this kind of helps them get a grounding on what to expect. We have people that are just starting their cheese or ice cream business. We also have people that are within the process. They kind of have some basics of food safety, but really need help to take it to the next level. And then there's some great small artisan companies that really have very well-established food safety programs, but come here to get a double check review. And then it also adds this really dynamic environment where we have people all along the food safety process. And during our breakout sessions, there's a lot of great discussion around what are best practices? What are you doing? What are the challenges that you face? And then we're connecting people in these locations with one another. So after these workshops, these discussions and kind of a group around pushing food safety is left behind. If we go to the next slide, at the start and at the end of our workshops, we do surveys to kind of understand what are our participants' perceptions of food safety, how challenging do they feel that it is, where are they at at the process. Then we have another survey to understand what are the changes after they've taken that workshop. And then we go back a year later and reach back out to these participants to understand, did the workshop actually help them move along in their food safety plan development process and implementation process? And did it have an impact on their behavior? And so we're just beginning to start to collect those year one feedbacks of the program. To kind of house this coaching workshop program, we've developed a website. It's called the National Dairy Food Safety Coalition that houses information about the workshops. When our next workshops are coming up, 
It also has links to all the resources that we use for the coaching program. So links to all the templates. It also has links where if you want a workshop in your area, you can go on here and reach out to us and request it. And we also have this email address, dairyfoodsafety at cornell.edu. It's a free resource where artisans can email us and get connected with experts either here at Cornell or at their region to provide them feedback on their food safety plan or answer any of their questions free of charge. And so we launched this website at the beginning of the year and are working to promote it so that all these artists and producers are aware of the resources that are available to them. And as part of the program, we've been running workshops around the country. Again, as I mentioned earlier, usually in collaboration with a local university extension program, with the idea being there that I or one of the other PIs of the grant travels out to that locations and we co-train with a university extension associate that may or may not be associated with dairy to give them knowledge about the concerns in dairy food safety and so that they can also act as a local resource for the artists and dairy producers within their region. And so you've seen we've done workshops from the Northeast all the way over to Oregon. The ones in blue are the ones that we've completed so far. We started this in 2018. We've got a few workshops scheduled for the remainder of 2019. Coming up, we're going to be doing a workshop this summer down in Richmond, Virginia, in association with the American Cheese Society's conference held there this year. Then we're going to be running a workshop in conjunction with the University of Minnesota and actually uh, Iowa State University up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Then we'll be working with the National Ice Cream Retailers Association and running a workshop at their national conference down in Charleston, South Carolina this November. And then we'll be closing up the year with a workshop with the University of Connecticut there in Hartford. Next year, we're beginning to plan some of our workshops for 2020. And if anyone here on the webinar has any requests, please feel free to reach out to me as we flesh those out. Our aim is to usually do around five to seven workshops a year, as long as we have funding through the grant. Again, we couldn't do this program without the support of other university extension partners throughout the country. And so we have a coaching fellows program on our website, which lists all of the uh, people that have worked with us on these coaching workshops or will be working with us in the future. And then they can be easily contacted through this website by anyone who has taken the coaching workshops or is looking for more information. So that's a good place to click. Our partners that we couldn't have been able to do this without are from all over the country. We work with universities. We work with dairy nonprofit organizations like Midwest Dairy, the American Cheese Society. And we've got the California Cheese Guild as well as the Cheese Guild in Maine that have all been great partners in helping us not only run the programs, but making sure that we can actually reach out to these small artists and dairy producers, because sometimes it can be hard to find them, and let them know that this resource is available and getting them to come to the workshops. If you want more information about this coaching workshop or you want to reach out to us with questions, please visit the dairyfoodsafetycoalition.com or feel free to email us at dairyfoodsafety at cornell.edu. Thank you. And if there's any questions, be happy to answer. Okay, it looks like we have time to take one of the questions by a few minutes. It says in some areas of the state, there are some individual farmers with small milk operation. How can we bring them to implement the milk food safety rules? Yeah, so part of this is about outreach and letting them know that these coaching workshops are available and that they should be coming to these. And in fact, a number of the participants that come to our workshops are farmstead cheese producers, right? And we reach out to them through organizations like the American Cheese Society or regional cheese guilds. They are definitely part of this, and we're working to make them aware of the program. And as far as that question on the National Dairy Council, yes, so we are collaborating with NDC through the Innovation Center of U.S. Dairy. So that's kind of their arm that we're working with at NDC. Thank you, Sam. And so we'll move on to our final speaker today. Uh, right on time, it's Dr. Bruno Shamia, and Bruno has a background in food engineering, and he earned his PhD in microbiology from Cornell University. He is an extension associate in the process of 40 at the Cornell Food Venture Center, uh, what we're the acronym is, is the CFBC. Cornell Food Venture Center provides product development and safety validation services to food companies in New York State and beyond, and Bruno is going to talk about some of the work that he does. Thank you, Beth. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us for this webinar. 
It's a pleasure to be here today with my colleagues to celebrate the backstage work we do every day, handling the challenges of ensuring public safety and optimizing the use of resources by food manufacturers towards this goal. Today, I uh, will speak very briefly about what we do at the Cornell Food Venture Center and propose a conversation about the challenges we face within the food manufacturing system, how these challenges have evolved, and what we expect to see in the near future. To this end, we will discuss how the increased concerns over safety led to an increase in demand for certification standards and eventually informed the new regulations that are now in place, especially focusing in the U.S. We will discuss the fact that these changes are happening in parallel with powerful market trends, with consequences boosted by our globalized food manufacturing system. Within this already complex scenario, we will still not need to add the technological advances that we have at hand now. And the new threats of new microbial hazards and emerging pathogens, such as what Nicole just mentioned. We have also seen a significant change in perception of the importance of proper data management and analysis, leading to an increased use of electronic systems for process monitoring. In this scenario, a fully traceable and transparent food manufacturing system is no longer a dream or an ideal, but a demand, and a lot of attention and resources will continue to be dedicated to this goal. I would like to start introducing our work. The Cornell Food Venture Center was created in 1988 with the mission to provide comprehensive technical assistance to farmers, entrepreneurs, and food companies pursuing new food products for the marketplace to enhance food safety and promote economic development, which is a fancy way to say we are the ones that will pick up the phone when small manufacturers need help in terms of food safety. We are an extension program hosted by the Cornell Food Science Department and currently provide food safety guidance to more than 500 different food manufacturers and help them bring more than 2,000 new food products to market each year. Our program has two offices in Geneva, New York at Cornell Agritech, where our pilot plant is located, and in Brooklyn, New York at the New York State Agriculture and Markets Building. In brief, our program acts as an external processing authority, a function recognized by the FDA as a person or institution that has expert knowledge, experience, and adequate facilities, equipment, and resources to make determinations about the safety of a food process and formulation. We follow up on requests by the food industry from all over the country for process validations, using our resources and expertise to schedule manufacturing processes, identifying hazards and establishing the critical controls or preventive controls now necessary to ensure safety of each food product. The report of this analysis returned to the food entrepreneur as a scheduled process, also called a process review in the state of New York, which can then be filed with regulatory authorities as necessary, depending on product classification. The original focus of our program used to be on fruit and vegetable-based products that were classified as acidified foods and hence subject to FDA regulation. But our scope has expanded to include products that are refrigerated, frozen, carbonated, as well as meat products and many others. We also have expanded from the original role of processing authorities, which was mostly focused on establishing thermal processing requirements. And now, following industry demand, we also provide guidance on non-thermal processes as well as on products that will rely on supplier verification programs to ensure safety, as Sam was just talking about. The Food Venture Center also provides training in food safety, including regulatory mandated programs such as Better Process Control School, and preventive controls for qualified individuals under the Food Safety Modernization Act. And we are working with the Institute for Food Safety to make even more training programs available. As my colleagues mentioned, Betsy Ben mentioned the microbiology training that we hope to have out in the fall. And there are many other exciting programs coming up. Our intensive work at the Food Venture Center puts us in a very unique position to perceive changes in the food market. But it's no secret at this point that consumers are driving the market towards more natural, less processed foods that have a strong health and wellness claim, as well as an environmentally friendly appeal. Some of these trends, however, might keep some food safety specialists, such as myself, up at night. In this example on the right, while replacing plastics with biodegradable alternative is an extremely welcome and important change, 
it is of great importance to ensure that the alternative packaging does not expose the food product to contaminants. And while plastics have usually very low or negligible contamination levels because the extrusion process occurs at very high temperature, right? The same is not true for, in this example, the banana leaves. And the sanitation process must be carefully validated to ensure quality and safety of the product. Altogether, these trends have led to an expansion of refrigerated and frozen sections in the grocery store, and this is a direct consequence of the processing limitations that food manufacturers face. Simply put, we must admit that healthier foods are usually also more prone to microbial degradation. Moreover, the lack of a process preventive control in many of these products, such as conventional pasteurization by heat, has brought back the need to rely more heavily on supplier verification programs to control safety hazards. And now this is widely used and sometimes overused or abused since their use as a preventive control is allowed under the Food Safety Modernization Act. In many circumstances, however, these controls, which often mean simply requiring a certificate of analysis, we call them COAs, right? from the supplier have very limited efficacy in controlling microbial hazards. In order to be effective, the manufacturer needs to make sure the tests are performed properly and using a third party lab is usually a good idea. Also that the sample sizes and number of samples are sufficient to achieve the level of assurance desired or needed. It is hard to imagine, for example, that a test that shows that 25 grams of the sample is absent in salmonella out of a lot of 20,000 pounds of peanuts would provide much safety assurance. And that's exactly what we're talking about. It's good to remember that this inability of insurance food safety by testing alone is one of the main reasons why HACCP was invented in the first place, which means that more work is needed to validate these manufacturing processes and properly evaluate risk. And I want to highlight what my colleague Nicole was talking about and the need for these environmental monitoring programs to be properly designed in same way for sample testing, final product testing. It's also important to consider that extra care must be taken when evaluating these innovative food products. Hazards in new products must be carefully evaluated, but also the food hazards and pathogens of concerning traditional products must be reevaluated under the light of knowledge regarding emerging pathogens. We talked about some of these already today, such as heat-resistant salmonella strains, those were found in peanut butter, a presence of salmonella introduced inside intact eggs, and also the example in their eggplants that Nicole was mentioning, increased resistance of listeria to sanitizers and the dissemination of pathogenic E. coli are probably the most eminent examples of pathogens that led to industry-wide changes in the past decades. These pathogens are usually present in low populations in very specific and contained niches in the environment, for example, in the gastrointestinal tract of animals, but they become a major threat when transported into the food manufacturing system. This risk is greatly expanded in a global food supply chain, which might explain how some of these pathogens emerged globally in recent years. Partly as a response to these new challenges, the culture of food safety within the food manufacturing system has evolved in scope, goals, and complexity. Notably, since the turn of the millennium, certification schemes became much more common, and we are all familiar with the main schemes, including BRC and SQF. These standards were built around the principles of hazard analysis and critical control points with a more comprehensive approach to food safety. In this scenario, the Food Modernization Act was introduced in the U.S., becoming a paradigm-changing regulation, also built around HACCP. The Act expands the concepts of HACCP, notably to include allergens as chemical hazards and introduce the use of sanitation and supply chain verification programs, as we mentioned, acceptable preventive controls. The Act thus creates a strong certification framework totally focused on food safety with also strong regulatory mandate in the background. And because the Act establishes a common language for food safety that is required for most food manufacturers, we expect that this regulation will contribute to a leveling of the playing field, opening communication channels between each node in the food manufacturing system and promoting greater opportunities for new strategies to increase food safety and take advantage of these communication channels. 
these uh, certification schemes that we just mentioned and the new regulatory requirements all have in common a more stronger demand for data collection and management, which quickly become a significant hurdle as companies grow. Apart from the regulatory changes, the food industry has also witnessed the impressive advance of new and re-emerging technologies focused on alternative processing of foods, including, as we show in this slide, high-pressure pasteurization, cold plasma, which is very promising technology for treatment of some dried ingredients, high-pressure homogenization, and gamma radiation also making a comeback in recent years. These technologies provide great opportunities for the big players in the sector to develop new products to cater to consumer demands. Ironically, though, small food manufacturers and specialty foods continue to take market share from large companies, which leads to a race of acquisitions that has also characterized the past few years in the food sector. But that's a topic for another conversation, which also impacts the food safety discussion. It's important to note that some traditional technologies have also experienced a great level of innovation. Modern agitator retorts, for instance, now provide a much faster total process time, which increases several of the quality of these products and back pressure systems that allow the sterilization of pouches make huge strides in several sectors and the quality of these products have increased greatly in the past years and some very successful products have been launched taking advantage of these technologies as well. With all these advanced topics considered, it's stunning that most food recalls are still related to problems that seem to be avoidable, such as mislabeling allergens, which accounts for about one-third of class one recalls. These preventable issues must be properly addressed to increase food safety and reduce risk in the food manufacturing system. And this perception explains the great interest around the development of electronic platforms that help food manufacturers to generate and keep track of relevant food safety information. At this point, I hope at least some of these brands look familiar to you. Food Safety 60, Food Logic Q, Red Zone. Each of these great products provide a solution to problems faced by food manufacturers of different types and sizes. Our program, the Food Venture Center, is also working to develop a tool to help small food manufacturers to generate proper records and maintain the data over time in an accessible manner. These tools will require a great investment of time and resources by food manufacturers, but they have the potential to help avoid a lot of the recalls, as we saw in the previous graphs, and food safety nonconformities experienced by food industry, which can be deadly to some of these small food entrepreneurs. Recently, the FDA has publicly announced that the agency will act even more proactively towards stimulating an increased use of electronic systems for food safety data management and traceability. We expect that this move will speed up the progress in this area and eventually establish globally accepted protocols to ensure safety of a global food supply chain. As these protocols become widely used, the use of technologies such as blockchain to validate each transaction within the food manufacturing system could be revolutionary to global food safety. Such protocols are on one of the essential pieces for the creation of a fully traceable global food manufacturing system that will bring all the available technologies, some of them discussed here, to be used at their full potential to increase the safety level of a food supply. And let's see next year how much of these changes have actually taken place. And we hope that uh, we continue the conversation during the year to make sure that we continue contributing to the success of food entrepreneurs in the U.S. and beyond. I hope this conversation was useful to you, and I'll be happy to continue by answering any questions today or by email presented here. You can please come to our website where we provide a lot of information to small food entrepreneurs. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you, and it's back to you. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Again, feel free to contact us. You can use our food safety at cornell.edu to send questions. If there are any follow-up questions you come up with later in the day, again, visit our IFS at C website and it has links to all of the programs that were discussed today. And thank you for joining us to celebrate World Food Safety Day. With that, I'll go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you.